This is it, the creme de la crop of endings, something I honestly hold on a similar level to If You May Be, as it ends just as perfectly as that series did in my eyes. We somehow made it out of the content cave to bring you the definitive, the last arc of Hell's Paradise, the departure arc. This, uh, this part of the series is actually like perfect. The way everything is wrapped up leaves me feeling completely content with it. Yuki Kaku was originally an editor who worked under the big G, Tatsuki Fujimoto, during Fire Punch, and due to his relationship with the boss of Jump Plus, he was able to drop this series without holding back on anything at all. And it's evident throughout this final arc that man truly didn't. But, before I spoil you on anything that did happen throughout this final arc, don't you ever just get the need for a mech, jump in and wonder? What am I? Which path shall I follow? The answer my fellow DGen is Mech Arena's League Divisions. Before we even get there though, Mech Arena is a completely free to play game, so there's literally nothing stopping you. Once you're in, progress through to Div 9 by playing a bunch of easy quick play matches. Then once you've smashed that out, you'll get stacked up with a bunch more stuff to do, like 5v5s or my personal favourites because I'm an absolute competitive theme, League Divisions. Divisions are in my opinion the best thing to like do once you get into the game, as they allow you the fastest way to progress in Mech Arena. Win matches, Merc Nerds, and earn ranking points. Earn enough ranking points and you'll go up a division. There are 11 divisions which act as an initial track of game progression. Each time you enter a new division, there is a reward which progressively gets better. Going up a division is a passive boost to general progression, as it resets XP caps on players and points them towards unlocking more resource crates along with extra boosts every win. It's a completely free to play game on Android and iOS right now, and also PC if you want to jam it on there too, and you can use my personal link or scan my QR code to get bonuses with $30. We're talking about one skin, one prodigy crate, and 5,000 credits to help kickstart your game. And if you're quick, you can add me as well, and we can play some matches together. So don't wait around and don't miss out. And thank you again to Mech Arena for sponsoring this video. Anyway, enough of that. Sit back and relax as we dive into the final part and wrap up everything when it comes to Hell's Paradise, its characters, and the world it's situated in. Kicking things back off, as all of the flowers around begin disintegrating, May and Yuzuriha confront Gufar who's holding onto that weird pot looking thing. Remember like that was where we ended right at the end of the last arc which was just a battle fest? Gufar lets them all know that due to Jika cutting down the divine Banco, he can sense that not only is the Banco's Dao destroyed, but the islands as well, hinting that the land will soon meet its end. The reasoning for what Zhu Jin did as well was explained to the humans who wouldn't have had a clue about her want to be praised by all of her fellow Tensin. Yuzuriha comments on how she felt that Gufar didn't seem bothered at all by the fact that the Tensons are all dying, but is told by him that death is not the end for them. Every being passes from life, but their Tao will still remain. Even though reversing their process is insanely hard, pretty much impossible under normal circumstances, the little man reveals they have a chance of being revived through the basin, pot urn looking thing that he's holding. Inside of the basin, it holds all of the fallen Tensons ovules, which, after a thousand years had passed, will allow them to fully revive. Yu's Riha, who like doesn't care about what happens a thousand years from now, decides that it was time for her and Mei to enter the floodgates, but is warned by Gufar that yes, she might not care about the future, but she better fret about what's going to happen in the coming hours from now, as Rian cannot be stopped. Meanwhile, over at uh, those sneaky old floodgates, Shugen bursts his way through the overgrowth and grabs onto the anchor's line in an attempt to halt the ship's departure to Japan. I don't know like what the man was thinking, and as we probably all saw coming, the line snaps, allowing Rien their safe departure. However, turns out Shugen actually tore the rope in half himself to use the anchor as a grappling hook to fling himself all the way up onto the boat. Standing there in front of the final boss, Shugen states that he doesn't care what cargo he intends to move, but he will never reach the mainland. Looking back at him, Rian tells him the same, and that not a single soul will leave this island alive. Darting at the immortal, she manages to easily defend herself against Shugen, but also tries to hold back as to not damage the ship's interior. Shugen screams at himself to not falter and slashes Rian across the chest, but this has no effect due to his water down not being the right match to hinder the creature's wood dao. Pointing her finger forth, he then shoots a blast of Dao which connects directly with the spot on Shugen's chest where his heart would be. Sliding back while gritting his teeth, the Yamada states that they will not fall to these dark arts of these fiends, revealing that somehow Rien's blast of Dao actually hit Tenza's headband which he'd placed under his robe. Thinking about how Tenza saved him once more, Shugen notes that that reckless assault will only serve him poorly, instead to when he must call forth the true essence of what it means to be a Yamada Simon. Choosing to replicate the abilities of the other Yamada to fight, Shugen bursts forth and uses a plethora of his friend's abilities to slash at the creature. Rien senses something strange with Shugen's Dao, and upon receiving another cut to his tannin from a replicated attack used by Shion, she starts to actually cough up blood. 
Jumping back in fear, Rian is just confused as she was sure this dude's Dao wasn't meant to affect him. Yet, after looking closer, realizes that Shugen has the ability to change the attribute of his Dao, which they always assumed was impossible. Seeing that they have to take him seriously now, Rian drops the control they had over the flames around them to give her full attention to her enemy during the battle. Shugen, who ain't really concerned with these flames, tries to attack, yet Rian, who would have loved to study this man on any other day, takes things up a notch and severs Shugen's right arm with a feathered fan. She then states that time for tinkering is over and changes to their true form as Yin allows for a far greater focus. Back over with the uh, children sized Tenson, May asks Skufa as to what exactly Rian's true goal was. Flashing into a dark room and using their Dao illusion ability, Gufa shows Mei and Yuzuriha what they saw earlier in Rian's laboratory. So remember in their last arc where Gufa got surprised at a revelation that wasn't really expanded on? Well here it's shown that not only did he find the ovules of all of the other Tenson, but also an extensive amount of research on restoring the body of someone, not the soul. Then, beyond that, he noticed a war that wasn't in place. Behind that unfamiliar door, hidden by an illusion, was even more research and notes that alluded to the true goal of Rien. We all think that it's to murk every single person inside of Japan, and yes, that is true. But, just as everyone reacts to these clones looking after a mysterious crippled figure in bed, Mei lets them all know that that person is the Grand Master. A sudden noise then breaks them out of the illusion, as Gufa explains that the noise came from Rian, who had managed to finally set sail on the open ocean after having dealt with Shugen. Despite the circumstances, Mei asks Gufa to continue with the explanation on Jofuku's plan. Gufa tells Mei that they are making an incorrect assumption. Jofuku had indeed died long ago and has already been turned into a gold statue so that his body can be preserved undergoing abification. Back in the past, when they were first not permitted to meet with their master, it wasn't because he was busy, more that he had actually arbified and passed from the mortal realm. For the last 700 years, Rien has worked non-stop for this day. The Way of Dao explains that the soul and body are one, and through this it led her to believe that they would have been able to revive the soul just like any other part of the body. Gufa then tells Mei and Yuzuriha that Rian's true goal is to revive Jofuku using the Dao of all of these citizens inside of Japan, not use it to make a perfect lecture for themselves like we originally thought. Knowing that Jofuku was already dead and while speaking in their native Chinese tongue, Mei asks Gufa who was the Hoku that they found earlier on when getting the basin. Then, and in a crazy revelation, the little man reveals that the person was the real body of Rian who had begun arbifying in that room. The person that they are familiar with is merely a puppet crafted out of Dao that she controls. The puppet's insane quality is due to the level of Dao manipulation that surpasses what every other Tenson is capable of. All of it points to one solid conclusion in his eyes. Rian is not even a Tenson, but in fact, a human and the wife of Jofuku. When Jofuku actually left ancient China with his 3000 voyages, one of them was indeed Rian. The Tenson all originally thought and were taught that they were an amalgamation of Mystic Dao and Flower Dao, yet this was false. First, Rian created another version of herself and from that, the other Tenson were all born. Back when a change first started to show in Rian, it wasn't because she was mad, but because her body had started to undergo arbification, limiting her time and only allowing her to control the clone version of herself remotely. Gufa, who doesn't fully understand the matters beyond his comprehension, just calls Rian foolish and starts to criticize the notion of love that humans have. In his eyes, it makes them pretty and cruel, full of arrogance, lacking in style, suspicious and paranoid, and even still, it drives them to sacrifice absolutely everything that they have. After over a thousand years of building everything, somehow Rian is willing to throw away everything if it just means that they get a chance of holding their love once more. Then, with a final statement, he tells them that within two hours, Rian will 100% reach Japan to initiate their plan. Taking this all in, Yuzuriha panics, wanting some form of break after everything that they've been through. She even questions if this is just another trap that Tenson are trying to set up for them, but Gufar explains that he's stuck in a paradox of his own. He wants Rian to leave, but also wants to save her. Unable to understand these feelings he currently has, he asks Mei for her opinion on the matter. But before she could even give her answer, Yuzuriya hits her over the head and tells her that they should hurry to where the others are. As a parting gift, Gufa warns her that according to the I Ching they found in Rian's room, which, for those who like forgot, I Ching allows the Tetsun to tell the fortune of specific people. Through this, he was able to determine that 100%, only two men and one woman will survive. Gufa himself relies on this Ching to force his fate, and those names who are unknown cannot be included in it. But Rian themselves may even be among those counted. 
One thing is for sure though, the art of Ai Ching does not lie. Having left Gu Fa, Yuzuriha and Mei then arrive at the entrance to the floodgates with everyone else gathered, obviously with the exception of Gente Tsai who's already gone ahead to try and stop Rien from departing, as well as the absence of the other brothers who have yet to return, and like they just don't actually realise that Chobe has passed on yet. After discussing how they need to find a specific ship with a like light low to catch the main vessel, the group enter the floodgates, only to be left disappointed that all of the ships have been burned. Looking out through the wreckages, Narugo spots one unharmed ship, but is told by Xion that they will not be able to use it since the wreckages of all of the other vessels is blocking the water from flowing and allowing them to move out. With everyone left absolutely hopeless, Gabimaru sees another vision of his wife in front of him and dives into the water to try and remove the debris himself. Jika tries reasoning with him, but our boy screams back that rethinking is impossible. He only has one goal and refuses to give up. Wanting to help and seeing the pain in his eyes, both Sagiri and Narugai dive in to help him despite it being an impossible task. Standing behind them, our little girl Mei thinks back to what Gufa had just previously asked her. Pointing her little hands forth and closing her eyes, Yuzuriha then sees Mei about to unleash her power, which she instantly objects to doing so since she knows that her body will be at risk. She pleads with her asking if she wanted to talk with Rien and Jofuku once more, but with a smile on her face, Mei explodes and transforms into her Kishikai state, commanding everyone to get on the ship while she handles the task of making a path. Which is like, damn Mei, why did you have to go and do that? I know there's this pot thing, but still Mei, like why? So skipping back, and back in the early days while looking after the first humans who came to the island with them, Mei asks Jofuku why he decided to bring people to the island, since the Emperor only seeks the elixir. Jofuku explains to her that because Dao goes far beyond just typical human understanding, she shouldn't concern herself with these difficult matters, pretty much saying that it's above the level of human-like capacity. In another memory, and after Rian finished a session of like dank bochujutsu with Jofuku, Mei is told by her to not feel ashamed by the practice, as even the young ones will perform this training someday, so she mustn't continue to harbour doubts. Then, as the children grew older, she recalls her punishment for defying Rien and how she felt powerless to do anything about it. She was fed up with it all, so she fled and told herself that she was unable to make a change. But after recalling Gufar's past question as to why she returned to Harai, Mei remembers that it was once again because she was fed up with it all. In the present, Mei explodes into a Kishikai state and continues to say that she was fed up with having fled over and over. Not anymore though. Now, she flaps all five of her massive wings and blows away the wreckage, giving everyone a clear enough path to get on board the ship. Sagiri prepares herself to yell out to Mei in concern, but is interrupted by Gabi Maro, who begins yelling at himself, telling her that she is at risk of dying if she continues to stay in her Kishikai form, and her original goal of being able to live a normal life will fade away. Mei then returns to normal, dropping out of her fighting form and hugs both Sagiri and Gabi Maro individually. She thanks both of them for everything that they have done for her, but this, this is how she takes responsibility for everything in her life. She tells the confused Gabi and Sagiri that watching them has a way of filling her with courage and finally thanks Sagiri for combing her hair in the past before slapping her palms together, revealing that they were actually in an illusion and Mei had indeed transported everyone to the ship safely. As Mei uses one last gust of her wings, she pushes the ship forth, allowing them to rush after the final boss. In her last moments, and as she begins to fade away, Mei apologises to everyone for not being there to sail off with them, to her father Hoko, to her family, and to Rien for not realising their feelings after they banished her and how she would have been able to stop them originally. Elsewhere, and aboard the ship, Algy, Blade Dragon, Tomaya Gantetsusai walks his way through the flames of hell. Over the other side of that like burning ship, Rian reclaims the elixir of life after finding it lying next to the defeated Shugen. She then wonders as to why he had it on him, but quickly dismisses the question after having it back in her hands. With the, uh, with the elixir returned, Rian sees that all that is left to do is put her faith in the paradise butterflies and becomes happy to know that her dream will soon come true. As things were going well in her favour, the puppet randomly starts to feel its body suffering due to Rian's Dao control starting to lessen. With time running short in her eyes, Rian hopes that she reaches Japan soon. Meanwhile, and over the other side of the flaming deck, Gantetsusai finds Shugen unconscious and starts to wonder as to why his severed arm wasn't bleeding. Shugen then wakes up badly injured and sees Gantetsusai standing right in front of him without Fuchi by his side, but soon remembers as to why this was not the case. Gantetsusai tells Shugen that he was glad that he managed to wake up, since it wouldn't have felt right to cut him while he was still down. 
Somehow, though, Shuga manages to block the first attack on him, but falls down after being knocked off balance, losing his sword in the process. Gentetsuzai tells Shugen that it is useless for him to fight back now that he has lost his right arm, but is told by the injured Asaimon that as a samurai, he cannot give up. Just straight up annoyed, Gentetsuzai kicks Shugen in the face and screams that all of them are a band of fools. All of this damn honor and dignity forced him to cut down one of his own friends. He punches him in the face and kicks him in the stomach while telling him that his ways of living are utterly corrupt. Shugen makes in an attempt to defend himself by swinging his sword, but fails after losing his balance once again. Gantetsusai then turns his back on Shugen, calls him out to be a purely pathetic samurai, and tells him that he doesn't care if he decides to burn to death now. As he watches the blade of his sword burn in the fire in front of him, Shugen grabs it and quickly cauterizes the stump of his right arm after remembering Fuchi's advice about disinfecting a wound. He practices getting used to swinging his sword with his left arm in front of Gantetsusai and recalls the time Fuchi discussed with him that the human body is a tool, and that by searching its construction and limits, one can manipulate it as they see fit. Gantetsusai then becomes shocked to see that Shugen, in a matter of moments, managed to adapt to using his left arm to wield his sword. The Yamada screams to Gantetsusai that Fuchi was caught up in his sentimentality, but says that his samurai spirit lives on within him now. Falling into another memory of the past, he recalls the time where he pointed out how weird the Yamada clan was. Fuchi, though, said that even though they got rocks thrown at them for being that, like, weird group of people, the clan allowed them to partake in his offbeat proclivities, and for that reason, it's always going to be extremely dear to him. Shugen then proceeds to tell Gantetsuzai that someone like him can never understand a samurai's sense of duty to protect all of those that they hold dear to them, and that he has long since abandoned his own sentimentality. After he finishes his statement, Shugen's eyes then mysteriously begin to invert and change colour. Not noticing this though, Big G points out the fact that he sheds tears quite a lot for someone without sentimentality and prepares to fight him, but senses something different. So, back over with the other group and earlier on before arriving at the floodgates, Shugen senses a strange energy emitting from the gourd containing the elixir of life and becomes suspicious of its contents, prompting him to straight up open the bottle and taste test it for any underlying poisons. Much of the shock of the shinobi accompanying him, he spits out its remains and then declares it to be safe for consumption. By the time he faces Gantetsusai though, it's obvious that the full effects of the elixir is shown to have run its course as Shugen's eyes start to change. In a rapid moment, he then darts at the elderly G and tries to strike him down. Comparing him to last time, Gantetsusai notices that Shugen is somehow able to fight properly as if nothing was even wrong and that the way he moves his body is similar to Fuchi's. To him, it's as if he's fighting against his own friend, which complicated things for him even more and meant that he didn't even defend as the fake Fuchi sliced at his chest. After his robe is cut open, Gantetsuzai sees the bandages that Fuchi used to heal him with before his own passing and decides to stop fighting for that reason. Looking at him, Shugen questions if he was ready to surrender. Yeah, pff, in a freaking million years though, like, like I, I think you need to understand that Big G Gantetsuzai is built completely differently. He tells Shugen that he was just remembering the reasons as to why he boarded the ship in the first place and how he never even intended to fight him. Slowly standing up now, Gantetsuzai explains that in the past he tore the provinces fighting anyone of strength, but at some point, they never even scratched the itch he sought to find. His nickname, Blade Dragon, came about after he took down his very first monster, a Ryokotsu, known to us feeble English readers as a ship's keel. With that said, Gantetsuzai smiles as he brings his sword down and slashes the ship in two, causing a massive explosion as the energy blast connects with the ocean below. Falling back with his wounds reopened, he laughs as he was unable to completely cut the ship in half, but figures that one more attempt would be able to do the job. Absolutely like enraged with what's just happened, Rien, floating there in the sky, starts to ask what in the world he's just done. Gantetsuzai then notes that like, obviously the ship couldn't even be sliced in two completely since it's actually made out of Dao. And then as she slowly begins to stroll towards the duo now, says that he didn't manage to cleave the ship in two, but did indeed manage to slow her down enough for the next crew to make it on board. Guessing that his work here is finally done, he readies himself to get off the ship instead of continuing to fight, stating that his life was indeed a gift given to him and that now he will not throw it away. However, he does tell both Rian and Shugen that someone else stronger than him will arrive shortly and that he hopes that they are ready to face him. Then, looking over the boat and through the flames, he becomes happy to see that Gabi Maru and the squad had finally pulled up. Gabimaro flings himself up on board the ship, compliments Gantetsuzai for the work he has done so far, and tells him that he will handle the task of taking down the ship as he faces both Rien and Shugen alone. So, it's the final showdown now, boys. But right back before boarding the ships themselves, Gabimaro pointed out that the flames were probably too strong for everyone but him to jump on board. 
So, alone now and walking through the flames like a Yamabushi monk, Gabimaru approaches Rien and Shugen. Shugen, then standing there himself, takes note of the setting in front of him and compares it to the portrait he and Aizen looked at depicting Hell. Which, in my eyes, just goes back to how like the series is called Jigo Karaku and how that word when broke down means one heaven and two hells. I like actually wonder if that also refers to the amount of survivors that this mission is going to end up with. Two men and one woman could have also been in front of our eyes from the very get go. I just, I love that like paradox as well. Everything about these like the end of the last arc and this arc here has kind of just been paradoxes thrown at people. Anyway, anyway, let's push forth and discover how Yuki ends this amazing series. Nevertheless, Shugen then announces that he will for the sake of the world and the clan punish even the devil himself. Hearing his war cry, Gabimaru commented that he's already used to this hellish domain, while Rian on the other hand just found her situation with them to be extremely irritating. In an instant, all of them then clash blades, hands and feet in a three-way free-for-all. Continuing, all of them then weave through each other's strikes. Rian blocks Gabimaru's attack and tells him that she will not allow him to damage the ship any further and will use everything they have to kill him while stomping their foot onto the ninja. Rian sees that Shugen was about to attack her from behind and uses her fan to counter him. Taking things up a level, Shuga manages to anticipate her attack and uses the Dao sensory ability and comes in to strike using Xion's water affinity. However, Rian, who's just like in another class when it comes to the level of skill, stands on the tip of Shugen's sword. Then sitting down, she tells him that as a Shinsen, the highest class of hermit, a human such as himself would not be able to harm her before raising her hand and firing a point blank invisible Dao attack. Watching this from the side, Gabimaru sees that Rien is a lot stronger than Sujin and Ran, but remembers from his conversation with Jika earlier that as long as Rien's priority is keeping the ship intact, he should be able to hold his own. In the battle, Rien suddenly becomes shocked to see that her tandem got slightly cut and sees that it was done by no other than our queen, Sekiri, who boarded the ship after remembering that Gabimaru will need her help since her wood Dao will actually harm Rien, and you know, like his alone won't actually be able to take her down. After Naruga, who's like still on the other boat with everyone else, makes a point that their best chance at survival is fighting together, the other survivors, with the exception of Jika, cause just man's always on the sneak and can't be bothered doing anything, all decide to board Rian's ship to take her down together. Rian states that a gathering of humans will do nothing to stop her, however Gabby silences her nonsense. He already knows that they're just a bunch of randoms who came together to fight, but they will do anything to survive and make it home together. Knowing that Rian Dao is too powerful, Yuzu Riha and Gabimaru decide that the best course of action is to try and have her deplete all of her energy here, similar to like how they managed to defeat Ran, and then with like everyone else acting as distractions around them so that they can keep up the battle. Sprinting forth, Yuzu Riha makes the first attack by using her Nimpo concealed armor ability in combination with her Nimpo puppet slime to create her supreme move, Nimpo Crimson Confection Guard. She knows that only two dudes and one chick will survive, but pushes forth either way and puts her faith in Sugiri and Xion, knowing that both of them can make the final cut together. Rian with like complete ease destroys Yuzuriha's armored soldiers, but is struck in the head after failing to notice the sneaky Kunoichi charging towards her. Even still, Rian manages to simply send her back with a down-fused blast. However, in that moment she's caught off guard by Narugai, who, while sliding behind them, remembers Xion's teachings in the use of Dao and cuts Rian's left arm using Tenza's Ito Ryu ultimate pounding torrent technique. With her body beginning to fall to bits, Rian quickly reconnects it and uses the partially severed branch arm to grab a hold of Nurugai, but luckily for our mountain warrior, has her limb once again cut off by the blade dragon who came swooping in. Gabi Maru, who like comes down from above, notices a perfect opportunity, and in combination with Gantetsuzai's merciless eye killer move, Sky Peak Splitter, uses his secret art, Shandi Gus, to simultaneously light on fire and cut the immortal's tandem. With Rian left wide open, Gabimaru calls out to Sagiri and Xion to perform the combined attack to destroy Rian's tanding. Stepping forth, then, in a perfect motion, both of the Yamada use the ultimate techniques, Hidden Blade Jewel Wheel Motion to bisect the Immortal's top half, sending it flying into the air and bringing the intense battle to an end. In retaliation, the Tenson simply claps their hands together, revealing that she's perfectly fine, and the events that had transpired were simply an illusion of Dao, all created by her, which is actually just freaking mental. Looking to her left, Sigiri watches Xion fall down in front of her. With herself still stunned, Rian walks forth, revealing that everyone, except for Shugen, Isuzu, Kiyomaru, and Gabi, has already fallen. Irritated with the pathetic foolishness of these humans, she explains to Sagiri that hermits are those who touch upon the truths of this divine plane. The only thing that has ever remained beyond their reach is the world of gods themselves. Still, in her eyes, she will soon reach even that state. 
revealing the Buddha-like Kishika state that she wields. All that remains now in Rien's eyes is the complete destruction of Wagawo. After seeing Rien enter a Kishikai form, Gaming Mario prepares to use his technique against her, yet Rien instantly blasts him in the face with a Dao Lightning Bolt before he is given a chance to attack. Scary comes in and actually manages to stab Rien's tendon from behind, but is told by the Tenton that her Dao is far too weak to harm her body. Seeing that Sagari was about to be crushed, Shugen jumps in to save her from Rien's Dao manipulation and orders both Isuzu and Kiyomaru to have the criminals return to the ship, explaining that they could not allow a monster to steal the Amada clan's duty to execute them. Which is absolutely crazy that he's still got like that in the back of his mind with everything going on right here. Anyway, hearing that some of them were going to like try and escape, Rien dismantles the entirety of the ship's exterior, sending pieces of wood flying everywhere while keeping the room where Shofuku is placed intact. Elsewhere, and like while Sagiri holds onto Kiyomaru's hand, she becomes extremely shocked to see that the young Simon has already been crushed by a piece of debris that was previously sent flying. Poor dude, rest in peace Kiyo, that's, uh, that's one down. Seeing her comrade, Isuzu becomes shocked and rushes towards their direction. However, Ren senses her exact location and literally takes control of Isuzu's body before ultimately crushing her in front of Shugen, much to his horror. Screaming for both of his friends' deaths, Shugen jumps up to where the immortal is and tries to attack Rien in a blind fit of rage. Sneaking up from behind as well as this happened, Gabimaru grabs onto Rien and sets himself ablaze with an intense amount of flames, which in turn allows a megalomaniac Shugen a chance to cut off one of Rien's arms, but also as a side effect, he is caught in those flames as well. While trying to completely incinerate her, Gabimaru has a sudden memory of Yui's face and ends up ceasing his attack, realizing that he'll perish if he continues in this battle. Looking at his own hand, he notices that his Dao is starting to resonate with Rien, and because of that, he falls into a similar dark world to that of Zujin, before suddenly bursting into a bundle of flowers and falling to the ground, arbified. So, back before the um, board of the ship, Jika did his, you know, like his thing and made a bunch of predictions as to how the survivors should go about fighting, but believes that there's absolutely no solution here. Knowing that, Jika himself, as I've said, decided to stay on the ship as, you know, they've got to have someone guarding it. In the present though, Jika watches the outcome on the ship and sees that he was right on the survivors not being able to stop Rien. He then brings out a drinking barrel and decides to toast to the end of humanity. On board of the skeleton vessel, and while watching Gabby Morrow start to arbify, Rien says that she knows not of his ambitions, but hopes that he has pleasant dreams, and as she then goes to land the finishing blow, believes that all those who are still alive currently will die in this fire, or will lose the will to fight as soon as they reach Japan. Sitting there herself, Sagari feels that she's utterly powerless and reflects on all of the times that she failed to do anything against any of the enemies. She then looks at Gabby Morrow and begins to say that she gives up but stops in her tracks after seeing just how bad his arbification truly is. Rising to his feet himself, Shugen, badly burned from Gabimaru's flames, orders Sagari to return to the other ship since she cannot fight in the state she is in. He looks at the reflection in his blade, and to him, it's obvious that our girl has lost her resolve after witnessing too many of her close friends pass away. So, and since she is like literally the only heir left of the clan apart from Jika if he's big chilling on the boat, he orders her to board the other vessel as he cannot afford to lose her. Having survived being fatally wounded himself, Shugen boldly states that he will make Isuzu and Kiyomaru proud by eternally carrying out the clan's duty without any doubt within himself. As she senses Shugen's Dao surging, Sagara remembers the time Shugen congratulated her for earning a rank and how she would bring about a change as a woman to the clan's male-dominant trade. Speaking up, Scary questions Shugen if it's even possible for people to live on without doubt. And if they do, does it even translate to strength? Over the entire time of this mission, she's come face to face with doubt over and over again. Her doubt, as well as the doubt of the criminals, executioners, and even the Tenson. Everyone struggles in life and doubts themselves only to struggle some more. If abandoning doubt is truly the way of the samurai, then like Shion, she rebukes the role and states that she isn't one in that case. With all of the fallen Yamada placing a hand on her back, she screams that she refuses to leave these feelings behind and instead, while picking up her sword, exclaims that to the bitter end, she remained full of doubt and confusion as for that is who she is. And I'm like, hell yeah, that gave me the biggest spur of encouragement I've actually ever had while writing a script. 
And I, this is for you guys as well, reading this video. Everyone's way too harsh on each other these days. And I'm way too harsh to myself with like my pronunciation on words or the way I say things. But this is how I grew up. This is the country I'm in. It's the way I speak. Get used to it. I can't do anything about it. It's like if I was Indian or something, you know, like or in another part of the world. It's just there's only 4 million of us in New Zealand. So it's a very unique accent. And like Sir Gary here, I'm thanking Shugan for these words as we're truly grateful for him. Looking at her, Shugan feels this random ass sensation emitting from Sir Gary. It's neither tranquility or intensity intensity, but something else completely different. Sigiri herself then looks back at Gabi Maru and asks him in her mind if it was okay for her to have faith. Skipping back and a time once passed, we see Gabi Maru being introduced to the eighth daughter of the chief of Iwagakure, Yui. Initially, she becomes spooked after Gabi Maru raises his hand towards her and pats her head as if she's like some sort of pet. Yui questions his action, to which Gabi Maru answers that like ever since that day, he'd wanted to become more open with her, revealing that now this is kind of like a dream state that they're in, reflecting on past memories. But in that time, it just didn't feel right. He'd stolen lives, so he'd thought he'd never qualify for a normal life. Yui says that she doesn't really like understand where he was coming from, and tells Gabi Maru that he is still eligible to have a normal life despite his past sins. She notes that he seemed to be suffering some kind of pain, but the acts of regret and reflection are all part of those of atonement. She asked if it was enough that just a single person accepted him for who he was, causing Gabby to question what she meant. Thinking on this, Gabby believes that it was enough and that he should accept himself for who he is so that he can finally be free of his burdens and move on. In the present now, Scary raises his sword above Gabi Maru's arbified body and tells him that he must accept his burdens while continuing to live on. She then brings her sword down and executes the role she was initially charged with. Momentarily, Gabi regains consciousness with his body back to normal and finds his own flower arbified head in front of him. Noticing that his sense of self had finally returned, Scary explains that she had to amputate the parts of his body that were deeply rooted with vines and use the most outlandish method of Tao restoration by pressing his tendon next to hers. While he stands there impressed with her approach, Sigiri states that she cannot see a way to defeat the enemy, but is told by Gabi Maru that they need to keep fighting as long as they're alive, much to her satisfaction. Gabi Maru also thanks Sigiri for leading her back towards doubt to increase the speed of his healing. She did this by like guiding their thoughts in his head, bringing up his wife at like ETC when she went to drop the sword down before. After Sagiri jokes about actually following through with like her original task like I mentioned before, Gabi Maru says that they cannot rely on fate due to the risk of failure that it's given them and also readies himself to fight alongside Sagiri together. Over with the others, Sheon and Narugo fall into the ocean while carrying Big G who remains unconscious. Chika then tries to bring them on board the ship as requested by Xion, but falls into the ocean as well due to being overly intoxicated after his uh, few sips on the drink back there before. After everyone including Yuza Riha is brought back to the ship, Chika lets them know that it would not matter if they had saved him, since he believes that Rian is utterly unstoppable. While on the other ship, Rian sends his Dao growing from where Gibi Maru and Sagiri are and looks in their direction. Jumping towards her, Rian fends off a plethora of attacks by them and uses a bolt of lightning as an attack on them, but misses Sagiri after Gabi Maru pulls her out of the way. Over with the others, they all watch as Gabi Maru and Sagiri fight in perfect synchronization, but Naruko also points out that they need some sort of strategy in this fight. Darting forth, Gabi is handed Sagiri's sword and goes in to strike Ren's tandem. However, Jika notes that that strategy will not work since the hindering attribute will lose the necessary power needed. Using another strategy, Gabi Maru attempts to use Sagiri as a human sword by holding her legs and quickly flinging her around, but dismisses the idea after it doesn't work. In the light of their ridiculous tactics, Ren sees that she cannot afford to waste any more time fighting them and must take down Sagiri using her bulked up arms now. Over on the other side of the boat, Shugen looks at Sagiri and remembers the time he felt worried that she was selected for the Shogun's mission. He assumed that her kindness would be a hindrance, but now, in the light of things, starts to see that it doesn't. Sagiri remembers how Gabi Maru pointed out to her that she lost her Shija due to giving into anger instead of focusing on the middle path that gives Dao its power, and in that moment, accepts both strength and weakness and doubt as that makes her who she truly is. After her doubt is strengthened, Sagiri attacks Ren with a clear mindset of knowing that she is the spear and the linchpin that will take Ren down while our sneaky, while our sneaky sneaker, Gabi Maru, is the spy from within the shadows, as after all, being a sneaky shinobi is what he does best. Bro, that was so sus for me there. Moments before Sagiri made her charge and remembering that Ren's true goal is to revive Chofuku, Gabi Maru tells her to remember what happens when those extreme emotions take over. It weakens their doubt. Dao is held together by a clean discord between both Yin and Yang. 
too much sway to either side and their power fades. So if your heart is filled with rage and indecision, then maybe they have a chance to win. In reality, and as Sagiri is placating the big boss, Gabimaru lands in the same room as the gilded statue of Jofuku, causing the Buddha wannabe to start falling directly into their trap. As he charges towards Jofuku's corpse with his Ninpo Ascetic Blaze activated, Gabimaru knows that when Udao is disrupted, Sagiri will slash her tandem. The timing has to be perfect, but as he goes to smash down on the floor of the boat, notices that there is a post-wedding brazier, a flower crown, and a pair of traditional wedding garbs laid out in front of the statue. Stunned, Gabimaru thinks back to when Yuzuriha said Rayan's true goal was to revive her master. Yet, after seeing what's in front of him, Gabimaru for the first time realises that Rian and Jofuku are indeed a married couple. Beginning to falter, he tries to push himself forth as he knows that he needs to be in perfect sync with Sagiri, as this is truly their last moment, missing it means death. Seeing his wife with a smile on her face appearing in front of him though, and knowing the pain that it had caused someone to lose their beloved, he drops to the floor, unable to follow through with his plan. Unexpectedly though, the merchant of death. Sir Order 66 himself, Shugen the G, jumps out from behind Gabimaru and screams that to be a samurai means being prepared to give up your life at any moment, for duty as the pride of a samurai and the pride of the Amada clan. Raising up his sword, he envisions Aizen doing the same, free of thought till death, with single devotion. Towards the embrace of death's warm grasp, he brings down his blade with a vision of a demonic eyes behind him, allowing him to deal a powerful Dao imbued slash that not only slices Jofuku's gilded statue in two, but the entirety of his ship itself. Having witnessed the confirmed passing of her loved one, Rehan screams in horror as her late husband's body is destroyed, giving Sakiri the perfect opportunity to bisect the Tenson and destroy her plant ovule. So, with everything lining up for our girl, she swings her own blade forth and manages to slice the immortal Kishikai in two. With the battle finally over, Sagiri, Gabimaru, and Shugen are seen exhausted, while the upper half of the puppet starts to disintegrate as it falls into the ocean below. Having defeated the immortal, the ship starts to fall apart since like the only thing keeping it together, keeping it held together, was Rian's Dao. After retrieving the elixir of life, Gabimaru yells out to Sagiri to grab his hand while they make their way back to the other ship. Sagiri wants to look out for Shugen, but once she turns around and sees that he had passed away due to overexerting too much of his Dao in the previous attack, continues forth. Randomly, Gabimaru watches as Sagiri suddenly receives a massive, life-threatening, gaping wound into her chest as she was caught off guard and hit by some sort of Dao-infused attack. With Gabi Maru left in utter shock, he turns to see that the culprit is Rian, who stands before them with her body being partially covered in flowers. Her only desire was to ever be with her husband, and now, because of that, she states that this is the end of everything. She furiously vows to Gabi Maru that she will take away everything from him and the other humans. Suddenly, Gabi Maru's left hand is then crushed by Rian's power, causing him to drop to the ground himself. Laying there herself, and after remembering a past lesson from Aizen about how a kashaku is needed when performing seppuku, Skeri comes up with the idea of using hemostasis on herself like Gufar, but quickly concludes that that idea will not work and help her recover. She then remembers Gufar's past words to her on how the only thing each side can do now is to steal more lives from each other, and ponders if that was truly the only recourse they could do. After seeing Gabimaru punctured by Rian's branches, Narugai prepares to jump on the boat and assist him. However, Jiki grabs her and explains that her power would never be able to stop Rian. Back over with the dying immortal, and while having Gabimaru suffer for his crimes, Rian remembers how he hesitated to destroy Jofuku's body and asks him as to why he did so. Gabimaru answers that in the moment he was about to strike, an image of his wife appeared in his mind, which caused him to end up faltering. As Rian thinks about her lost love, Gabimaru tries to reason with her, saying that maybe because the both of them had loved ones, they could somewhat relate. Having heard these words, Rian looks back on her loving memories with Jofuku, how he ended up slowly starting to grow old and arbor fire while she, till the very end, stayed by his side. Remembering the love that she once felt and beginning to cry herself, she brings her hands together and in one final act decides to heal Gabimaru and Sekiri's wounds. With everyone around watching this bizarre change in like the battle, like they just, I guarantee you no one saw this one coming, Rian starts to finally disintegrate, turning her body into a bunch of beautiful flower petals. In the afterlife, it's said that Rian, who was finally at peace, managed to have her soul reunite with her husband.
Over on the other boat though, Chica, while like mad intoxicated, becomes happy with the outcome of the battle and tells Gabby Humaru and Sagiri that he had faith in them all along, much to their as well as like Shion, Narugai and Gantijusai's annoyance. On the other hand though, Yuzuriha suggests him forgiving him since like he is the one in charge of steering the ship back to the mainland. As they all slowly make their way towards Edo now, which is around about an hour away according to Shion, he informs everyone that he and Narugai will not be returning and will instead go their separate ways on a small boat. He also reminds them about their situation of who will get the pardon upon returning. And that's right guys, only one person is getting this pardon, two men, one woman. It's fate. You can't break fate, I tell you. Now, but right now, like before we get to the end of the video, I'd love to actually know who you personally think the survivors are. This to me is just like an amazing part of the story and it wraps up everything so beautifully. It's, it's like Full Metal Alchemist where you're just the last like few episodes of that. It's just, I love it so much and I can't wait to see what the anime does with it. Anyway, after seeing Sagiri depressed about everything like that is about to happen with all of her friends departing and stuff, Yuzuriha tells her that a happy ending was never going to be possible for them and asks if an executioner like her started to become fond of criminals. Sagiri wipes away the tears and happily answers yes as after a while she came to see them as people dared her heart and asks if it was wrong of her to not know what to do in this situation. Yuzuriha says no and points out that everyone else beside herself was actually a villain, which leads to everyone having this like hilarious conversation about just how villainous each person is. After everyone ends up pointing Gabi Maru and his wife out as evil, Gabi shocks everyone after he laughs at the ridiculous notion of Yui being a villain. Having become interested in wanting to know more about his wife, the group then sits down and asks Gabi Maru to tell them more about her, to which he agrees, and after their conversation is finally finished, Yuzuriha, Gabi Maru, Gentetsusai, and Sagiri all stand up together to try and figure out who will return with the elixir of life. My voice is actually giving up. I don't know if you guys can hear it. It's like croaky at some points. Shortly after, the Shogun then becomes informed that his ship has returned for the island voyage with only two men and one woman boarding it. Drum roll, please. Dum 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 dum. At the Magistrate's office, Sagiri and Jika present themselves to the Shogun as the only two surviving Asaimons to make it out alive and are ordered by Aoki to make the report. Sagiri remembers back to how Jika said he will take the initiative on making the report, but wonders as to how he will do so. And Jika looks completely different now, he's like mixed up his style, he almost looks like a chick in some kind of way, like he's goody two-shoes Jika right here. Chika first bows his head in complete gratitude for being assigned with the mission and tells them that since Shugen has lost his life during the mission, he will be the one to make the report. Chika then presents the deliverance of the elixir of life and presents that the only surviving criminal was Gantetsusai, the blade dragon. With this, Tamaya Gantetsusai is then pardoned by the Shogun. And I never, not for a second, doubted Big G. I knew this is, I knew my man was going to take it home, like the blade dragon. No way was he gonna die on that island. Everyone knows that he has to he has to die in infamy, you know what I mean? Like that's the only way I wanted to see Gantis decide go out. Anyway, before allowing Aoki to end all matters, Jika asks him about the arrangements that were made concerning the Iwagakura chief. Sneakily, Aoki confirms to Jika that the Iwagakura chief was dealt with after the latter testified that the leader had his own ambitions during the mission, which was viewed as treason against the Shogun. So because of that, he was taken out. Much to like, you yeah, know, Sigiri's shock as they show him like the taking out evidence and stuff. I can't really show it, but well, I don't know. Aoki also reports that the body of the chief has been transformed into a tree after they forced him to test the effects of the elixir before beheading him as per Jika's suggestion after he probably got back, I'd imagine. Anyway, Aoki then questions if the state of the chief could be viewed as immortality, but is convinced by Jika that the Shogun could possibly live forever as a divine tree to watch over his family in exchange for his humanity. Which I think is just hilarious, like imagine being stuck as a tree for humanity, like, I would hate it, like the dread. After the business with the Shogun was finally over, Jika, absolutely knackered, falls down and becomes pleased that things went according to his plan. Earlier on the ship, Jika saw that Gabi Maru and Yuzuriha had picked Game to Society as the one to receive the pardon due to his high reputation and suggests that they themselves actually abandoned their own names and former life upon separating on boats. As obviously, Yuzuriha is just like a random ninja that had like a few things known about her and Gabi Maru himself is just a name passed down throughout Iwakakure, so his face specifically isn't actually known. Anyway, as they prepare to depart, Skari receives a goodbye hug from Narugai and yells out her farewells to Yuzuriha who happily waves back already having started to leave on her own vessel. Looking over, she then sees that Gabi Maru is the last to depart. The two 
then meet each other's gazes. And as Gabby Mario walks by, happily says their goodbyes without even having to say a damn word to each other. And damn, I love this panel, just the smiles on their faces as like Gabby walks past Sagiri there. Brings a tear to my eye, like when I first read it, it truly did. Like all of this part, yeah, my throat when I was writing this script was so like sore because I was just, I was wanting to bore my eyes out. It's just so beautiful. Anyway, in the present, G can see Sagiri thinking about like all of the others and tries to cheer her up, stating that it was fate that brought everyone together. And now all they can do is hope that whatever path they're on in life, it will make them happy. After hearing these words, Sagiri looks up, happy for everyone with a smile as she begins to cry. Meanwhile, Toma is also revealed to have somehow found a boat and departed Kotaku alive, but also not by himself, dude is mysteriously accompanied by an unknown person. Skipping away for him for now though, after the arrangements were made by Jika with the uh, chief being taken out, it meant that Yui would obviously be alright as well, and Gabi Mara would be able to go back to the clan, or like leave with Yui and they'd be able to travel off and live happily somewhere else. Gabi Mara, who had finally managed to make it home, becomes shocked to see his wife, Yui, standing atop some stairs and eagerly runs towards her. After finally being reunited, the couple then set out on their own path in life. So we finally made it, huh? After 126 chapters, we have made it to our boy meeting his wife again. She ain't fake. She exists and didn't have to murk Big G along the process. It's pure bliss in my eyes right here. Skipping forth in time, over in a British Hong Kong during the mid-1800s, a young man sitting in a chair notices that the men looking down do not look like the locals, to which he is informed by his brother that these men are from England due to the recent war causing chaos and power in the area. Yeah, you know who it is. You, you guys know who this is. The Bandit Brothers, Toma and Chobe, big chillin' back together. Chobe, like, hearing this, becomes pleased since he, he believes that this is an opportunity for him to take over the city and declares to the Englishman that he now rules over the underworld from here on out. Just dope hairs. And I love the fact that, so, Toma obviously never made it back to the mainland of Japan and instead probably, like, sailed off current and ended up on, or in China and back, like, Hong Kong area, which is quite, like, a... I, I guess that's probably where Gufa went and like Gufa knows the language there and everything as well so they wouldn't have been completely confused. I really really like that ending for him and it doesn't like conflict with everyone in the mainland as well. Back in the room though, one of the Englishmen suddenly whips out a gun and calls Chobe a freaking baby, which Toma translates for his brother. And after learning that he was insulted, Chobe transforms into his breakdown state and murks the dude for just insulting him. At the same time, in a tea house in Japan's Hitoshi domain, Shion gives his opinion on Naruka's new appearance, saying that she was too young to wear that, but is told by her that she prefers this new look and the other girls around her all dress the same. Naruka is then hit on by two random men, which she found flattering, but Shion obviously wards them off as a threat. Naruka becomes disappointed but is given a lecture by her like pretty much dad figure about how all the men in this world are either beasts or thieves. Then noticing some like dirt or food on her face, begins to clean it off. The two then decide to head off together to try and find Naruko's people, and having watched this entire thing, a random woman wonders if they are father and daughter despite not seeing any resemblance. Meanwhile, in over with us, Sagiri and Yuza Riha while they're travelling, they talk about how Gantetosai has actually opened up a dojo dedicated towards medicine and swordsmanship. He's repping Fuchi, I love that. And a flash over there, and after finishing up a patient himself, Gantetosai is issued a challenge by a man at the door, but yells at him to silence himself. I love that, just the parallels to like who he was in the past and everything. It's, I've got the biggest smile on my face right now. Sagiri then reveals that Jika has taken over the Yamada clan as the next head and is now enjoying an easy life just like he wanted, which is dope for our man. After being tasked by Yuzuriha as to like why she chose to travel, Sagiri answers that it was a good way to help her polish her blade testing skills, but also says that she wanted to leave home for a little while. Yuzuriha figures that her current journey is, is most likely to visit Gabimaro, but remembers her past statement on it being a bad idea to do so. Sagiri replies that she couldn't help the urge for a little reunion, so obviously pointing out that she wanted to go and find Gabi Maro, then asks her mate why she also decided to accompany her. To which Yuzuriya answers, it's because she wants to be her bodyguard who secretly loves her. Looking over at a random woman though, Yuzuriha then spots Yui outside her house and as soon as Sagiri sees her as well, screams at her name in surprise. Standing outside their house together, the three girls all introduce each other and begin having a chat about all of the things that have happened with them. Once they walk inside, Yui offers to wake Gabi Maru up to have him see them, which causes the chicks to be surprised as Gabi Maru probably didn't sleep at all throughout the entire time on the island, apart from like the obvious knockouts, and he refused to sleep when he was told to. Scary also finds it hard to believe this, but states that he was no longer the same Gabi Maru as before. 
All of them then roll over to check up on Gabby Morrow and after seeing just how out to it he is, states that they probably can't rouse him as dudes go from stray cat to literal house cat. Letting him be then, we skip away from Gabby for the final time of the entire series and leave the three women as well to have a fat yarn with each other about everything that has happened so far. Time then slowly slips forward several centuries to where we find Gufar running an online class while living in human society. Funnily, like Hell's Paradise ended during Ovid, so this whole online class thing hits different when you think that for the last two years this man was writing the series, he was probably stuck indoors doing so. But anyway, May then enters the room to tell Kufar that Jufar and Dalfar have sprouted, which was a lot earlier than anticipated. Then, walking off together, Gufar then says that he hopes all of the others progress just as well. Well, after so long that officially brings us to the very end of Hell's Paradise and here its departure arc, I absolutely loved how the series ended in general with like us getting the payoff of actually getting to see kind of what happens with each character in the future, you know, like does May survive, does, he, does she eventually come back, you know, what does Gufar get up to and turns out he's a teacher in the, uh, the future and everything. There's just so much that I absolutely love about this part of the story in general and just how it ends. It's, it's like Full Metal Alchemist where the ending is just brilliant and my eyes and I really hope that you guys feel the same way about it. There isn't really anything that I found that wasn't explained in depth that I wanted to know about the series in general or there wasn't like anything that went over my head that I didn't understand that wasn't later on explained in the series. Like everything was laid out so well and especially if you do like on the manga here you get a good amount on the back of each kind of volume that explains little parts of the story that weren't really you know like added in here but one thing i do want to also talk about with this series is just the meaning in general that is kind of like pushed on or you finally understand in the last kind of few i i guess you know chapters of the series here you you get to understand it earlier on like say when center dies and how like user reha kind of understands herself a little bit more and the fact that like it's not always about herself there are other people that she can come back and fight for you know and i really really like the idea of just believing in yourself as being the you know overbearing story it doesn't matter what kind of doubt you have it doesn't matter what kind of like indecision or like confusion you might have in your life you just need to believe in yourself and it's it, it really really rung home to me when i finally got to that last part of the arc there with sagiri and like just her just understanding that stuff I'm, I'm not gonna like try and conquer this doubt of of like mine i'm actually just gonna ride out and roll with this indecision and the confusion that I have inside me and be who I am and just like that there it just really really resonated with me like because I, I feel like everyone needs to just instead of looking online to see you know other people who they like aspire to be like or want to be like you just got to believe in yourself at the end of the day and I feel like everyone will be able to get to where they want to be in life if they just focus on themselves and I hate doing all like the the preachy stuff and all that kind of jazz but I just I just really really like the story in general and the fact that it wrapped up so beautifully Oh, it's just brilliant. But either way, I'd love to know what you guys all thought of the departure arc and say like if you had any questions that weren't answered throughout this arc, then let me know down in the comment section below and hopefully I'll be able to like go down there and just give you an understanding throughout like stuff that maybe I didn't mention in this video that was mentioned in the actual story and I'll just give you an explanation down there or just you know head out and get the manga yourself. It's honestly it's it's worth every single penny. The art inside it is actually just stunning to start with. So, I'm probably going to get a few panels of these blowing up. And I did this dope ass thing with Photoshop where I actually take some of the, uh, you, you might have seen it out there on Twitter. Follow my Twitter as well if you want to see some of the uh, the Photoshop changes ups that I did. Well, Photoshop changer ups that I did. I don't even know how to say that. But I like, you take the, uh, the panel and you can put this panel into Photoshop now and you can generate the entirety of the landscape around it. And it's just amazing what I was able to do throughout this video with that new tool on photoshop but again thank you to mecarina for sponsoring this video and make sure you go down and hit my link in the description so that you can get you know all your goodies and stuff either way for now it's been your professional degenerate diavolo subscribe if you are new around here to get these action-packed videos like this where i discuss entire series but for now i'll catch you all in a bit bye